All right, folks. Welcome. Chris Garlock here with Michael Redman. We got a real treat for you. Another great game from the Golden Panda Cup. Uh, we did one a couple of weeks ago. That was a lot of fun. So we thought we'd do another one. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, first, Michael, just wanted to check in. I know that uh, Neon Kian opened up and uh, you were uh, you weren't playing this past week. I think you had referee duties. Is that right? Yeah, I was a referee last week. So what does that mean, and what was it like? Well, um, usually there's something like 50-so games, um, tournament games being played on a tournament day. And because of the virus, um, they are doing some social distancing in the playing room, too. So it's a much uh -huh. lower number. I think in the various rooms, I think it gets to about a total of about 20 games that were being played. And wow. they need one official referee. Uh, to take the blame if something goes bad. <laughs> and that so was you, huh? Sometimes I do that, yeah. So, so is, I, I'm assuming all the players are wearing face masks, the game recorders. I mean, it's a, just sort of draw us a quick picture of what it looks like. I mean, I've seen photos. Yeah, everyone is wearing face masks. If there's anyone who's walking around and has forgotten to put it back on, like um, people will be taking them off when they wash their face or sometimes. Right. We're, do something like that. So I have to make sure they remember to put the face mask back on. Okay. And when people arrive at the uh, at the building, um, they have their temperature taken. Okay. At well, this point, it's just the professional players and, of course, the employees who are in the building. I don't think we have any of the um, paying guests who, who play as amateurs, that is. In, in the big main room there. Anybody that's ever been in the Yankee knows that big main playing room. So that, that's not being used right now? Yeah, you, you mean the big room where um, usually common people would just go in and play games? They're, they're not, right. I don't think they're using that. I didn't actually go and look. But I uh -huh. did not see any, um, any of the fans wandering in. Um, so there didn't seem to be any, anyone like that in the building. Well, let me ask you, and I got to ask you, because a big excitement for me this last week was our local co-op, which has been shut down except for ordering online, has been closed for over two months. And they just reopened with limited hours, but you had to you know, wear a face mask, obviously. And they gave you little gloves at the door, uh, little plastic gloves. Uh, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, you're handling go, go stones, right? You put, mm -hmm. you put your own go stones on. And if you capture stones, you're picking up stones that your opponent has played. So... How was that handled? Yeah, well, it's, they did that in a normal way. Um, it would have really bothered me. Um, to wear but, gloves. Yes. But of course, um, Tokyo, Japan has ended the state of emergency. And uh -huh. um, there was a, a period there where people thought that it was coming to an end. Um, I was a bit doubtful myself. but I'm still doubtful. Yeah. And so, so I think that people, generally Go players, um, seem to have been fairly careful. And there's, a, there's still a, a certain degree of trust, trust there, I think. Um, but it is very worrying for me because, like, in Tokyo, um, the numbers of uh, new patients, of newly found infected people is going up again. Yeah, here too. Here too. We're seeing a bunch of spikes. Half, half our states are spiking right now. So, And I was just thinking, Michael, that ghost stones seem like just the kind of surface that the virus likes, you know, uh, shiny and, and you know, the, these metal surfaces that they're always warning us about. I mean, yeah, I'm not trying to be paranoid. I'm just... about infection from the ghost. Yeah, that, that is something that I noticed, too, and it's something that bothers me. But yeah. uh, it's not as if you could take off a napkin every time. I, I guess that would be <laughs> yeah, actually. Every time you take your phone in stones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> take a little take a little spritzer and yeah, you know, yeah. wipe down each stone as you capture it yeah I should try making a video of that you sort should of <laughs> yeah, just, just use your little you know your, your yeah. phone and just yeah. shoot us a video we'll, we'll, we'll post it all right so we'll uh, that's 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 the news that's the news from from Japan thank you Michael um, just a couple of reminders before we jump into the game uh, we are live so of course uh Open to questions, comments, observations, whatever you like. Uh, our producer, uh, Stephen, who's in China, where they're also having uh, Spike, he was telling us uh, before the show that um, the latest uh, outbreak is uh, was actually at uh, the market, which provides most of the vegetables. 
uh, where he lives in Beijing. And so a lot of shortage of green vegetables. So, you know, take this stuff seriously, folks. It's it's not over. Uh, but anyway, uh, Stephen will handle a lot of those and he'll let me know if there are things that we should try and respond to. So we'd love to talk to you. We love your questions. Um, and oh, and uh, we've released our new series. I think we talked about this uh, last week, and the new series is out. Uh, do you just want to sort of talk about it for a little bit? Because there, we think we put what t three out now. I think right. Three are out now. Um, it's AlphaGo versus the world, and mm -hmm. this is about the time that AlphaGo came back after beating Lisa at all. Several months after that, it came back and started playing games on the internet. And at first, we didn't know what it was. And it went by various names. And, and the famous one is Master, of course. And it was super strong. And actually, the Master version is the one that has influenced me the most. Uh -huh. And also, I think that um, it has influenced most professionals most. It, it, it had the most influence on how we play the game. OK. So uh, I'd say it's a, maybe one of the most important, just because with the, in the case of AlphaGo, we're not actually inputting moves into it and getting a feedback from the computer as we would with um, modern programs like Leela or Katago. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it was just sort of one way because we were just watching games that AlphaGo had played. And the fact that Master provided us with so many games, like that other series we're doing is also a, a set of games that Master played against itself. And that's the Master version also. Uh -huh. And so um, when compared to the later and stronger version, Zero, Master has given us a lot more material to work with. And especially when it was playing the human players, um, there were a lot of points in its style that were uh, very attractive and easy to pick up for human players. Well, we've got, uh, Stephen will put up the link to, uh, those are uh, originating on Michael's uh, YouTube channel, and then we're, uh, we've got a, a playlist over on the AGA's panel. Michael, or, uh, Stephen will put up links for that. Um, just a couple of things about it. It's a different format for those of you that have been watching these, which can run, you know, hour and a half. Uh, I think our longest one is maybe 20 minutes. Mostly they're running anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, really That's focusing in... Yeah, I think I think we were kind of around the 12 minute mark for a while, 12, 13 minutes for a bunch of them. Um, this one that was but, something like 18 minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah, so but uh, we we're having we're having a lot. A lot of fun with them. They're 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 kind of cool, and and uh, uh, you should check them out. And uh, we're you know, we're getting a lot of comments, and we're trying to respond to all the comments. So check them out. Hope you enjoy them. We are going to be doing all 60 games. It's a bit of a marathon, but uh, and this of course will be the basis for Volume Two of uh, AlphaGo to Zero uh, that uh, you can check out when uh, when we when we get that put together. All right. So on to the Golden Panda Cup. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, you know, where we were in the tournament, who the players are, things we should know before you get into the game? Yeah, well, um, the Golden Panda Tournament was it, um, the PandaNet, uh, the um, internet ser server for Go. They we love, sponsored this. Say we love PandaNet. Yeah. Yeah. And it was this yeah. tournament with uh, five players um, in each team. So it's a three-team <laughs> tournament, just like the Nangxing Cup. Mm. And so the, the, there would be a first player, and, and, the, and the teams got to choose the order of their players. So it was interesting to see, for instance, the Iyama team were putting out some of their strongest players um, fairly early in the tournament. Okay. And so there was an Iyama team with Iyama Yuta as the captain. There was a Shibano team, and there, that's Shibano Toramaru. And then there was Ichiriki team. So it was these three teams. And they had some pretty formidable players in second and third place of the teams also. Um, and each team had one female player. And the last time we uh, talked about this, I was showing you the final game that was between Shibano. And it was Ichiriki, right? Right. And this is actually the, I think it's the fifth or maybe the sixth. Yes, it's, I think it's the sixth game in the tournament. Um, and Mutsura is in a winning streak. He's, uh, he was beating a number of players. 
I saw a photo of him. I don't know him. What can you tell us about him? He, he looks quite young. He's a young player. He has not made any of the big title matches yet. Um, he's a promising young player. His style, as you will see, it's not so flashy as some of the other players. So he plays a very solid, and especially in this game, you will see that he plays a very solid, uh, patient game. And um, he's actually having a hard time most, most throughout the game, but he wow. finds the one chance and, and makes something out of it. So he's a very patient, not, not so flashy, not like the player that a, a lot of people will find exciting, um, but he's still very young, so that could change. And I think All he right. does have a lot of potential. Let's take a look at it. And again, folks, if you've got questions or comments, just uh, throw them up there, and we will we will keep uh, keep an eye on those. And so the Iyama team. So I think um, I think I should have said maybe it's the fifth round. I think that might be correct. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and so the other two teams have lost two players each. And. The Shibano team, which is the one with Ichiriki, I mean with uh, Mutsura in it, is still on their first player. So it's um, it's time for the other teams to get serious. And Iyama came up. So so Iyama is the captain of, captain of his team, and he's already showing up as the third player. Wow. And let's see. Iyama has the white stones. And this is a point where you would see computer programs suggesting moves like um, for white, moves like A or B. Um, and of course, it's interesting to see that black is playing a tight shimari here. This is sort of going against uh, what the computer programs suggest, where computer programs really like to play a, a big shimari. They would like to, they would want black to play something like maybe here. This is the, the move that I've been seeing a lot in AlphaGo's games. Or, of course, black could play a Kakari first. This would be more common. Black is playing a tight Shimari. White actually has a number of choices. Um, while A and B would be the ones that, um, like, Needle Zero or Katago would be suggesting, white score is probably not going to change very much with this move anyway. And black plays a Kakari. And white kicks. This is, this is the way they play it now. White kicks and jumps, forcing black to play another move there. And white gets the double card. Uh -huh. So uh, this is still perfect, dead even. It's perfectly even. And at this point, black has a lot of choices. And even with the computer and analysis, it's not really clear how black wants to play. Like, basically, it's either this attachment or this attachment. But it branches out after that also. So for instance, if black starts with this attachment, White's probably going to uh, play here. I should mention that uh, people who have been around a while will remember this, Joseki. But uh, if you get to this point, then this is just considered good for black. And in fact, even before we had um, Go AIs, you might say, uh, most people thought this was good for black. So it's, it's not really a valid Joseki anymore. Sometimes you'll see players uh, play something like this and get into something completely different. That's really complicated. It doesn't really affect the game. So I'm not going to, um, in this game, it doesn't come up. So I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail. OK. Um, attaching here is by far the most popular move now. And black will probably play here. In this board position, black does um, seem to have a local advantage. Like if we look at the local position here, it's the same number of stones. So that, that's, that's not a local advantage for black. But black does have this shimari, the corner enclosure in the lower right. And if we look at the entire board position, while white has a low position here in the lower left corner, black does have a high position with, with this group on the side. And so in general, if we're looking at a kind of a big triangle here, black seems to have more stones towards uh, the center of the board or where the, the fight is going to happen. So I, I would. With black, I would kind of have a feeling that I want to play actively or aggressively in this area. So something, so this would be connecting on the third line like this would be the fighting version of this Joseki. 
And then after this, Black would um, like th this. I could talk about this for the whole day because it, there's so many variations that are um, sort of equal in value. But at this point, Black could jump at A or start with the pincer at B. Like if Black jumped here, then Black would be threatening um, the pincer on this side. And it would be a, that kind of fight. Or if White answered on that side, then Black could pincer here next. Um, here or even even on the third line would work too. So Black would have those choices. On the other hand, if Black um, if Black played here immediately, then the weakness with the with White pushing to, through the cut here would be more um, more dangerous, and it would be a more exciting uh, a more exciting fight with Black doing stuff like this to try to deal with that. And I wouldn't be sure um, how all of these weak groups would fear like it would be it would be a very tech um tactically sharp fight mm. so th this is one way black could have done it and it would have been taking advantage of the fact that black if we look just at the right half of the board black does have an extra stone there and so there's potential for black to fight strongly it would be very exciting and, and it's the kind of way a fighting player would play so that's the way i would play it in the game, Black plays an attachment on the other side. And in this case also, it's, it's, again, it's not so good for White to do this kind of thing. It's just, this is just considered to be locally good for Black, the, the outside influence that Black gets. And the fact that this White Stone has been captured, it's just the fact that there's these wasted, two, these two White Stones um, have sort of been locally defeated. And the fact that most of Blackstone, so the only wasted Blackstone is basically this one. It's, you could, it's arguably in a, a, um, an exchange with that. So like, I could, I could find maybe one wasted Blackstone in this group, whereas there's right. two white stones. But when white attaches here, which is by far the more popular, and we have to remember that this, this move is still viable. This move still can be played. Um, it's just not so popular right now. We're not seeing it so much. But when white plays here, again, at this point, black has a choice. Like this is the move that um, used to be called a uh, handicap game, Joseki, and it's still not supposed to be so good for black. Like black and pincer here, it's, it's not a um, decisive dis difference, but when, even if white immediately starts moving out, the problem is that this wall that black has here is actually eyeless. So it's a weak black group. And the fact that white's group here on the other side is already 100% alive, just about 100% alive, the fact that that white group is so strong will make it difficult for, for black to, to win this local fight. So despite the fact that black has a wall, it's actually not a very strong wall. So that, that's why professionals don't like to play this move. Actually, in the game, black cuts here. And this is a fairly modern version of this joseki. But in this case, as I've been saying, black does have a local advantage on the right side. So I would want to play this way. And white connects. And again, I, I'm going to play the strongest local move. Like there's another popular joseki with attaching here, which um, usually leads to something like this. And then white would play some move on the right side, maybe somewhere around here. Um, and this is the way black plays. It's relatively safe because black can immediately live by cutting in the corner here. So it's a relatively safe variation. And if white connects in the corner, then black's going to play here and get a nice position on the side. So this is where black, this is a good way for black to play when black is not so sure about a local fight. But when black seems to have a local advantage on the right side of the board, like in this case, I would rather play this move, which is the strongest. This is the old fashioned way to play, but it's also the strongest local move. So it's still, it's still play, playable. And White will probably just extend here. Um, the other option being this one, like there's a lot of options in between here, but this is a way White plays when White isn't gonna attack. So there's a problem when Black pincers here. So in this case, I'm gonna have White play the two space extension. Let, let folks know why I think people may be worried about the uh, push and cut. Yeah, pushing through and cutting here. Um, for, there's two problems with this. One is that the fact that this group in the corner is relatively difficult to kill. Um, so for instance, if black plays here, it's, it's already alive. 
Uh -huh. And there's the fact that the white stones that white has played are sort of in a clunky shape here. So it's, it's not as if white's getting a good shape. So right. locally, there's that one problem. There's also the fact that if white does it immediately, there's this cut on the third line. And white would be forced to crawl underneath. And so this would be relatively easy for black. Like even if black, black has two ways to go here, black could play this way. And um, probably just live in the corner now. And so with the forcing move here, and, and black could be pushing along the fourth line, we can see that black is going to develop a fairly strong group there in the center. And it's just going to be this, this white group that is weak. Mm -hmm. So this sort of, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that even if white pushes through and cuts, um, it's going to be relatively difficult for white to generate any potential to attack anything. So white gets a lot more out of, um, actually, white's hope here is to, at some point, to force black to play a protecting move, like something like this. So white would be more in the pattern of playing something on the outside and then here and saying, I'm going to cut you, I'm going to cut you, and hope that black eventually has to put a stone in. Like a move like here is not a, it's a, it's, it's, as far as territory and stuff like that is concerned, it's going to be a wasted move. Black doesn't really want to play that move. Got it. Thanks. So to go back to, so I, I'm going to say that white's going to play here just to finish that variation I was talking about. Um, I figured something like this. It looks like an even fight. Like this, I, um, to be completely honest, I did use an AI. But this is very close to what I would have done anyway. So um, it just sort of reinforced that. It, it'd be interesting. Black does have this nice extension here, which would put some pressure on white on the side. And a lot of weak groups heading out into the center. Like none of these groups are 100 <coughs> yet. So in this, uh, in this game position, I think that the fact that black stones in the lower left here, although there, there's a good bit of distance there, but the fact that those black stones are sort of pointed towards the center is going to help black in the long run. So I sort of like this for black. So uh, that's what I would have played. This is where Mutsuura played. This is a, a relatively um, a calm way of playing. Black gets out, outside influence like this, and white gets the corner. So this corner territory is not yet 100% safe. Sometimes black can cut in the 3-3 point and cause some trouble. But for the time being, I'm going to call it white's territory. And black captures the one stone. Again, a very calm move. I'm not really myself. I'm not always the calmest player. <laughs> so I like to mix things up a little bit. Um, I would prefer to play in a, a Kahari here once. And if white play something, then I could play here. I, I think that taking this point on the upper side is pretty important in making use of Black's influence in this area. Having that Black stone on the left, in the upper left there, giving it some space for the influence to, to build up. Uh -huh. And then, of course, I would be looking to, to maybe play something to the fifth line next and, and get into the center. Um, my instinct is that I want to give that capture that Black has played. Black's strong position on the right, I want to give it um, plenty of room to, to work with. So when Black takes here in the game and White plays here, I'm slightly dissatisfied by the fact that I, I would not, it, it's more difficult for Black to find a good way to use this, um, this strength towards the center. So that's just, to a certain degree, it's a matter of style. But there's also the fact that white does not have any effective uh, ladder breaking move. Like even if white plays here, um, it's it's not really going to be that damaging. Mm. Um, in fact, it's it's questionable whether that was a valuable move for white to be playing. That that's why in my um, example here, I was having white playing a relatively normal move. Um, black's position there is strong enough that it's not going to be damaged too badly by white even attaching against it. But black played this solid move and then extended here. So black is, instead of doing the upper side, black is building on the left side here, probably hoping to expand that into the center like this. And we're actually going to see him try to do that. Ah, wow. Okay. 
and black played here. And this is actually where um, Black's score went down a little bit, according to the computer program. I think uh -huh. I was using Katago, uh, okay. just because this is a six and a half point combing game. And I was really impressed by what I was shown, because Black plays a ladder break here. I mean, no, I'm, Black just plays a shoulder hit. Uh -huh. And the way Black continues is going to depend on how White answers this. Like, White ha usually has a choice of pushing on the fourth line or crawling on the third line. So if white pushes on the fourth line, black is going to play tightly on the left. And that's going to get rid of any invasion there. So um, the meaning of this is that when black plays here, it's going to be really in easy for white to invade here on the fourth line. And there's it's going to be difficult for black to attack that stuff. We're going to see that happen in the game, actually. So when black plays here and white plays here, uh, black will play here. And later on in the game, black will be able to cover it A and get a nice territory on the upper side. So covering it, white, by playing this exchange, Black has created that follow-up move of covering it A and just grabbing the upper side territory, which is something that Black can do just because Black has this very strong position on the right. This strong position makes it uh, possible for Black to play what looks like a greed move there. Hmm. And if White crawls, this is where it changes and Black's gonna play something like this, which uh, very quickly connects up very loosely, but quickly, just with the one move, Black has sort of connected up that line there and made a borderline for for a future uh, framework. Well, already has a framework. Well, uh, uh -huh. potentially a territory there. If this area becomes Black's territory, obviously Black is going to win the game in most cases. Uh -huh. So okay. already putting some pressure on White with this huge area that Black is controlling. And the point is that this, this move is not fully, it's not fully drawing that line. And there, there's still some open space in this area, which means it's a less complete line. So I really uh, enjoyed um, seeing this move suggested by the computer. Um, when Black is getting a more solid territory, more potential to equalize the territory in this case, or getting this uh, this attractive big moyo in this case. It's just make, giving the choice to white. So I really like this move. I, this is one of the shoulder hits that was relatively easy for me to understand and see how it was working. It's very cool. That's a, that's a nice sequence, right? Yeah. We do have to remember that these games are uh, relatively short time limits. So I, I meant to ask you, actually, what were the time limits? I've forgotten. Oh. Uh, um, Actually, I've forgotten too, but I think they had something like, uh, it was like an NHK tournament. So it was probably 30 seconds or something like that for each move. And then the time, they would have um, extra time. I think that's right. We'll have Stephen, yeah, Stephen, Stephen will can, probably can pick that. that. But I think that's right. Yeah, but, but that is something like 10 units of um, extra time that the players could use whenever they wanted. That's pretty fast for a pro tournament, right? It does fall on the category of lightning go. Uh, right. <laughs> I, uh, the other day I played uh, move uh, ten second per move game, uh, a number of games that like that. And that's really lightning go. But even if it's thirty seconds, then it, it's usually called lightning go. So this is Iyama as white. He's played the shoulder hit and extended in the lower right corner. So this is actually an unusual way to use the shoulder hit now. But this is the old-fashioned way of playing, and white has this follow-up move, so it does work. And black plays pressing here. If black plays, uh, if black just plays out like this, then we have a position where this point and this point are mia. So mm -hmm. if, black, if black continues with this, then white gets to. This is a nice shape for white on the outside. Otherwise, if black pushes, then the corner is taken away. So th this would be a success. I think this would be a success for white, too. White would continue like this. So this is fine for white. So it's, this, is, um, this is the shape move here. White does get the Hane once. But after this, white shape is going to be a bit more cramped. It's, this is at, having this, this black stone here in the knight's move rather than having it at this point. It's, it's just that much more effective. And uh, if white, for instance, if white wanted to take 
solid territory on the side, white would be crawling here, but that would be a lot of moves on the third line. So I suppose black would play something on the side here and would be attacking white on a large scale. So that would be okay for black. So in, instead, white usually plays this um, this jump here. And in the game, black just covered. But uh, again, Katago wanted black. I, I think that it was actually Leela Zero that wanted to play this. Um, I always, I use them together. So sometimes I get a bit confused. But this, in this case, it's actually going to be a, a shoulder. It's going to, this shoulder hit is going to be a ladder breaking move because black can play here, and now there's a ladder involved when white uh -huh. plays here. There's this ladder. So these two moves here in the upper left had to do with that. They were not only um, influencing black's potential in the center, but they were um, breaking the ladder for this ladder. Gotcha. This would be, actually it's probably about even, um, but I would be happy to play with black in this piece. I, I like the way it's turning out for black. So this would maybe be a bit better. Th this turned out to be a slightly slow move, um, but I think it's just Mutsura's style. Interesting, you know, he has the same first name, his given name is Yuta, and so that's the same name as Yama. They're, they're both called Yuta. But I think the character for their name uh, the characters for their names are slightly different. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I was, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Okay, so black has trouble um, directly attacking this white white stone. So black is going to try an indirect attack here with this. And this is where um, Go AIs are going to say that white has a slight lead. And I'm going to have trouble seeing it. So this is a point where, for instance, uh, the AI answer to this is just to play one Atari and extend here. Uh, it's Katago that says that. And Black's going to follow with an attack at A. But after this, it becomes really complicated. Like, it's not really clear whether White's going to sacrifice that stone on the left or, or what is White going to try to do. And it differs every time, just a, every very slight difference in the variation. It's going to give me a different strategy for white. Uh -huh. And um, so my conclusion there is that it's just going to be, if I was white, um, even if the computer tells me this is good for white, I, I know that I would have a lot of trouble making this actually work in a game. Just because that even watching um, the computer programs um, give me moves, this, the apparent strategy tr changes um, every time I try a different variation. Right. Like it's not clear um, what I would call the plan. It's not just not clear. So it's a position where um, white does obviously have an advantage in territory, and I would feel happy with white in this board position, but I... Um, I wouldn't feel safe. I wouldn't feel that I had a lead that I could take to the end of the game because right. for the time being, it depends on what happens on the, on the left side. So I, I would be saying, I'd be saying exactly that. That would be my feeling in the game that it all depends on what happens on this coming fight on the left side. So instead, white played a double hane. And this is, locally, it's the strongest move. It's a stronger move that is moving more forcefully into the center. For instance, if black answers with something like this, just that difference is going to be a huge difference. Um, it's, it's the exchange of this stone for that uh, clunky black stone. Obviously, it's good for white. So white is going for more in the local position. And by doing that, white is also leaving a weakness in the corner. And so it's a trade-off. White's playing strongly towards the center um, while giving Black an opportunity to take something back in the corner. And Black did that by playing here. Um, I just marked the board. I might as well make a variation here. If White covers here, Black's going to play an Atari. And then uh, this is obviously bad for White. So that's, you might say, that was the, the threat there when Black played here. Uh -huh. And white just ignored it. 
And that was that was a good idea for white. White just plays away for the time being. Now this is threatening black to by with a capping move there, so black was gonna answer. And this is a kind of the way that black is playing here is something you actually see a lot of in professional play. Black is it's very hard to see what black is accomplishing here because black is not getting a, a very effective attack on white. And white seems to be establishing a leading territory. And I do think that I would rather play with white, but you do see a lot of strong players playing this way. Um, especially this patient way of playing is pretty, it's pretty typically a Japanese style. It's, it's more common with Japanese players, I think, but it can be very effective because it keeps the game uh, relatively close. Black is getting this extra territory and potentially in the lower left corner, and Black is keeping the territory fairly close, even though Black is sort of behind. And when we look at the black groups, all of the black groups are healthy, and white does have potentially a weak group. So black is just sort of waiting for a chance to attack. And it's a very patient way of playing. It tend, even when black loses, it's probably going to be a fairly close game. Uh, to that question of black waiting for an attack, there's a question that folks have about why black wouldn't do a, uh, an Atari uh, at G3 rather than B4. Um, at this point? After the, after the double hane. Um, well, black plays here. Um, locally, black does. For instance, black could continue with this and take the corner. Um, but it's just, it's not as good as it might look because because of all these dead black stones on the outside. <laughs> like, it, it looks like, um, it's like the operation worked, but the uh, patient died kind of thing. <laughs> you know? nice. So black, black actually do, would do better like in the game, Black chose this move. Otherwise, Black could have cho chosen, this would have been very similar. It would have been a similar idea, and White would probably have given up the cornerstone anyway. So it's probably better, either, even though Black is getting slightly less in the corner, it's probably better for Black to be playing this way, in which Black's position on the outside is still holding together. Mm -hmm. And Black has not played any of those... Um, all the black stones that, that, that were hanging around in this area, uh, none of them are here. It means that even after black, I'm sorry, even after white plays something like this, um, black will always have, in the future, will have moves on the side like this or a peep on the second line. Black has healthy moves that black can choose on the lower part of the board later in the game. So all of those black stones that we were seeing in that other, let's see if I can find that, for, oh, sorry. Tried to find it and went off somewhere. Um, so all of those black stones that we were finding in this variation that were just dead are getting in the way of any move that black will want to play on the lower side later. So like if black continues with this, white could even just continue in the center. Um, so white, white gets a bit better position in the center, which will help this white stone. And there's the fact that the lower side is just completely worthless for black to play in, in this position. Yeah. So that that's... It's a it's a um, a move that would locally work, but Black doesn't really want to lose all those stones in the process. Gotcha. Thanks. So White played away. Yeah. Um, at this point, yeah, Black played here. Um, actually, this move um, it's another it's a very typical move. It's true to the style that I was talking about, and that Black is keeping the territory relatively close. Um, but it was a bit slow. And so this is another point where Black's score went down a little bit. And strangely enough, this was the, by far, this was the most popular move according to my computer program. And it's just reinforcing this Black group a little bit and threatening to clamp at A. Clamping at A would be a very effective move next. So uh -huh. White's probably going to answer that somehow. This was a good time for... <laughs> be playing that ex exchange. And otherwise, Black is going to be maybe pincering on the right side, starting a fight there, and, and trying to um, make that work with the upper side, maybe, the left side. And the game Black played here, this was just territory. So it, it gave White uh, an opportunity to um, take things one move ahead. Actually, at this point, White had a, a 
um, a fairly clear lead if White had played here. Um, but um, the fact is, it would be a fairly close game. So, like, um, I think this is in this game, this is sort of Black's strategy here is just to take it into the end game and try to make use of his thickness because it will be a very close game when White does this kind of thing. And you can see Yama is just trying to get a bit more as far as territory is concerned. He's trying to establish a bigger lead in territory. And so this is sort of Yama's style. He, he doesn't like to simplify things with moves like this. He prefers to keep it a bit more exciting so that he can bring his fighting skills into the game. And we're going to see what White pays for this, because from here on, you're going to see a black territory appear in this area. Uh, I've been it's wondering sort of, about that. Yeah. At this point in the game, it's, it's sort of hard to envision that um, yet. But the fact that Black gets to start an attack here is going to build towards that territory in the center. So this is going to be a good example of how Black can use his thickness to do that. Because this is all possible because of that thickness that Black has in this general area, which is building one of the walls for the territory, but also it's putting a lot of pressure on White and stopping White from playing any aggressive moves in the area. Uh -huh. At this point, White can, White can always add a stone at this point and, and live. So it's not in any danger immediately, but it's, it is wise for White to jump out once here. And now Black Pete um, plays the capping move. And he plays another slow move. Like this is just typical of him, I guess. But this is a point where I would definitely not play this move because it's a move from a strong black group. So again, um, Katago was suggesting black A, which would just be, um, it would still be a, a fairly forceful move against the corner. It would still be threatening to clamp there at B17. And otherwise, moves that were coming up were, this move, we'll see it happen in the game. Uh, it's a kind of a key point that when white plays here and black plays here, black is creating a cutting point here. So it's um, it's putting some pressure on the white group. Another move that um, I was seeing coming up as one of the candidates was this move, because it's just putting pressure from the center and expanding black's potential in the center. So I would say at this point in the game, if black makes a big center there, it depend, everything depends on how much, how big that gets. And so black has potential to have a good game here depending on how big it is. But when black played here, white got to um, speed up a little bit towards the center. So when white jumped out here, this did reduce black's potential in the, in the center fairly, um, fairly effectively. And the fact is that this, this area here, uh, white's connection is strong enough. All of these stones are pretty much connected. So it's not as if uh, playing here made much difference to that. So black jumps and white, this was a big move. Uh, like I was saying, it would be big for black to play, for instance, something like this, threatening a cut on the third line, or maybe starting with here and playing that next. Mm. Black does have a big move on the, on the side here. So white plays the big move, just getting more and more territory. At this point, white's uh, lead in territory is pretty, um, pretty obvious. Yeah. Black plays the capping move. Um, this was a nice Tetsuji here, where Black is going to scoop out some of White's territory. Like if White, if White plays here, I think Black's just going to come here and here, and then would um, continue with this this move, I think. And with the peep here, like if White plays here, I think for the time being Black would play here, but Black will have a peep here, which will cause trouble next. Uh, so you can see black is getting into the white territory there. This would be very effective. Like one, one attack like this, uh, this is a, a big success locally for black. Uh, just doing this once would um, turn the game around, basically. So this is the, the way people who play like this tend to win their games, just by um, suddenly in the end game, they use, they use the fact that they have fixed positions and in this case, Black has gained a lot of territory by making use of that. So it was correct for White to play a Hanai underneath. 
and black cuss. So this is the tesogy. This is um, this is actually almost a textbook tesogy, in which case, if White plays an Atari on the right side Blackstone, if White tries to capture this Blackstone, it's going to open up on the other side. Like if White plays here, then Black can play here, and you can see the corner is going to be broken into. So this would just be just too dangerous. Um, yeah, this might be okay. Otherwise, maybe Black is just going to play a hanging connection here and push through. This this would also work. This might be the safer the safer way to do it. Um, so White plays a hunt underneath and just captures the one stone. So this was the correct answer for White, but Black did get a little extra. Um, pushing white down to the second line there. And now finally black is finishing the center territory. And we're entering, entering the end game here. It already looks like an end game. Yeah. yeah the I game mean... is fairly close, but white has a lead at this point. Like black did get a nice territory here. So like suddenly, almost magically, at the end of the game, Black did get this extra territory, and the game is close enough. I so how was, close? What, what, are we, what are we talking about here? Um, I think Black is going to have trouble uh, giving Komi. Um, wow. Black's playing by a few points before Komi. So like if this was a game that where there was plenty of time, I think it would be very, very difficult for Black. But the fact that uh, both players are in, in time pressure uh, does, uh, right, it right. actually turned out to give Black a, a chance. So the, the fun starts from here, actually, because... Okay, I was, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for something to kick off here because everything has been fairly peaceful fairly and patient. Yeah. Well, when these players play thick uh, for thickness and um, strength like this, they do have a, a kind of a sting. They, they, they suddenly uh, start to fight. So this was a point where... <laughs> Uh, when white played here, it was very much like Yamato play this kind of move. It's, it's the most locally aggressive move. White is trying to play some forcing moves against Black's center position. So, like for instance, if Black plays, um, if Black plays something like this, then White would uh, continue with probably something cautious like this. I think it's it's a good idea for white to be a bit cautious here. And white would get the full territory here. In this case, white would be winning before Komi. Yeah, it's huge. So he was just a little bit greedy, but he's, um, it is, I can see that white is putting pressure on black's center because white is threatening to do stuff, stuff like this next, putting a bit of pressure on black. But it was an overplay because uh, once black cuts here, this is suddenly an extremely difficult situation. So if White had just played, if White had yeah, just played here. I have been wondering about that cut. Yeah. Well, White just, um, just to go back a few moves, White has just played here, which was a pretty big move, and has closed off the side there. If White had just finished that with this move, White would have had an advantage that would have been good enough. Um, if it wasn't Iyama, I would have said maybe he got a bit impatient by playing this move. Um, mm. It was a bit of a careless move, I would say. Mm. And right, the problem you're is saying like, it's a time issue, time issue possibly. It could right? be a time issue. It could just be that he was. Um, it lo just looks to me like for a moment he was just careless there, um, mm. just because things were going on so well for White up to this point. Um, but it's deceptive because, as I was saying, it's it's not as big a... White seems to be getting his way throughout the game, um, but actually the difference is relatively small. So it's it's that's something that's sort of deceptive about this kind of game. Okay. But once Black cuts here, it is very... it's very complicated. And so that's one thing that makes it um, dangerous because because of the time... Uh, control. The fact that it's very complicated makes it dangerous. And after a moment, we're going to see that not only is it complicated, but it's already apparent that this is not as good for white 
as it was before. So if we just compare this position with this position, um, in real time, during the game, if I was the white player, so I'm, I'm going to assume it's the same for Yema, I think the white player at this point has the sudden realization uh, this is worse than it would have been if white had played here. And yeah. Realize suddenly that you've messed up. <laughs> and this is where the white player is going to get confused, according to my experience, because the, the, real, the fact that you realize that you've messed up it sort of clouds your thinking to a certain degree. Uh, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. still trying to find a position that gives you a clear advantage. And that's sort of, it's sort of gone now. I think white might have a slight advantage if white had played this move. Um, but the fact is that when he was thinking, obviously, it's, it's relatively easy for white to see that there's a way that black can make this work. So black has a plan here that is working. And this one was relatively easy to see. So actually white did not play that move, but switched to this side. And it's gonna be even worse. <laughs> no. So just to show you what was relatively obvious for white was that oh. black did not oh. play here. And this is something that like, um, just in a few seconds, white could have read this out. Black has these forcing moves. And then this is a forcing move against white threatening to kill white on the right side. So white's gonna follow up with this. And already you can see that these white stones in the center have been captured. They're just dead. Like, um, obviously this is bad for white compared to the game pre previously, right? Um, so if white connects here, if white connects here, black can just connect to the center. It's hopeless for white. <laughs> Um, this so it's started looking like one of my games, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it looks like one of your games. Okay, it does. it's very easy to see that this is a failure yeah. for what? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's very easy to see it's a failure. The thing that's less easy to see is maybe it's still good enough for white. So what I'm going to be talking about here is that if white continues with this peep, it turns out white's going to be getting something back in the center because black cannot afford to sacrifice these two stones. White gets to reduce the center, so something like this. And this is going to be a very difficult end game to execute because all those that empty space in the center, uh, the players are probably going to fill that up, and every move is going to be um, pretty difficult to calculate. But this is a close game, at least. Um, the fact that white is probably going to get rid of most of black's territory in this area. Um, it partially makes up for the fact that Black captured these stones. And actually, the game is fairly close. I think I would root for White in this game. So it's maybe a slight advantage for White still if White had played this way. But the point I was making back at this point when I, when I said White did not play here, uh, the fact that this is working for Black is something that's relatively easy for the player to read. Yeah. Uh, even even with time um, with time issues like this, it, it's it's a very quick read. It's a fairly um, straightforward sequence. Right. All you have to do is notice that black eight is going to be a forcing move. Right. So this usually I, I would expect the white player um, usually would just cut off the reading at this point. Say this is a failure, and the failure um, with this move is relatively difficult to uh, calculate because I think maybe White had the idea that White's getting some extra territory here, giving up six stones on a relatively small scale, and it looks like White can get into the center a little bit here too. So maybe that was the plan. But there was, um, there was a, I think my guess is that he misread, it, he misread it a bit further into the variation. I'm, I'm gonna show you now where I think he misread it. Okay. Because instead of going after just the six stones by playing here, instead of playing here just to take the six stones, Black's saying, I'm, I'm going to take the whole group. Oh, no. And um, now, how do I explain this? There's a, a potential problem with this move when white cuts here. Let's do that with a stone. When white cuts here and black connects here, 
uh, then white has this cut here. So you can see that's going to be an effective move towards the center. It's not going to be good enough for white if this whole group is just dead. But um, because of this cut that white has at one, um, I could say that, uh, that wedging here, because of that, wedging here is a slightly, it's a, a frightening move for black to choose. But um, this is going to work perfectly for black. And I'll show you how that happens. Because mm -hmm. um, when white cuts here, this means the whole right side is going to die. And so white does not have a good time. Um, it's very hard to find the right timing to cut here, basically. Because once white plays that, the liberties of these white stones here are filled one, and it changes things. And I think uh, Yama must have misread that. He starts with the Hane, and he connects here. Once he exchanges this connection for this black move, black has already accomplished capturing the six stones. And now when white plays here, black can go back to the center. At this point, surrounding the center here is now more important than going after these five stones. In fact, the five stones are already safe. But um, the fact that black has already established some profit here, and now black can go back to the center with this move. Black's got both sides. Black profit <laughs> in the center and on the side. So the point is that if black had just played here, this would have given white the initiative to be doing stuff like, for instance, stuff like this in the center. And it would have been a different story, slightly. But the fact that black can start with the wedge, and all white could do is play this exchange first and then cut, the cut comes too late. And black gets to protect the center. And white has to play one more move to save those five stones. But these five stones, they're already long gone, the five, six stones here. So black got the best of both worlds here. Black got to play on both sides. So why did that happen? Yeah. My theory is that um, Yama thought that he could play this one first. So maybe like at this point, if white cuts here, what happens? So this is a nice little, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a problem here. Uh -oh, so black uh -oh. connects. And now white connects. Um, and now it looks like, now if black is going to play here, this would be a lot better for white because white would just cut here and capture that black stone on the side. And you can see the fact that in the game, white didn't get to play that exchange. Like here, this came too late. And it was sort of not so interesting for white to be taking that one black stone. It's just a kind of a, almost just a one point move, right? Right. So in this variation, white would like to have that, oh, sorry. Uh, white, white would like to have that exchange in and be able to take this stone instead. So that's the point I was making there. So did you see the answer there? What does black do? I'm, I'm trying to look at something I think is probably a bit too uh, clever, frankly. On the other hand, if black plays here, white gets to live on the side. So that basically white was trying to make me eye of these two. Oh, sorry, me eye of these two. Like if black plays here, white gets to cut on the side. If black plays here, white's alive on this. Then white just saved everything. This would be good for white. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, what's the next move? It's like one of my uh, Tsumengo problems, because it's, it's almost a life and death problem. In fact, it is. Um, Green tea. Yeah. Yeah, I had some um, black tea earlier, but I'm not sure it's helping. So, yeah, those two things don't. I mean, I'll tell you what I'm looking at. I'm actually, I'm, 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 you're talking about something local on the right side, right? On the right side, there's a local tissue with which. Well, something like, something like, you know, T, T, no, that's not going to work. Yeah, I'm looking at something like the placement of TA. Let me see if my uh, my team has any uh, suggestions for me here. Uh, somebody's suggesting I got a T10 and an S8. Let me take a look at that real quick and see what I think. T. Oh, the Hane. Ooh, the Hane sounds interesting. I wonder about, yeah, what about that? What about the Hane? 
Yeah, well, this is the answer. Um, I think black might even get away. It's really a weird move. Black could probably even get away with this with a similar result. Yeah, but this is definitely yeah. not the Tesuji. This is not the Tesuji that people would teach you. And this is the answer. So that, uh, whoever said T10 was correct. All right. Uh, just to take a quick look at S8, that doesn't quite work because white just cuts and captures the one stop. So the idea of filling a liberty there was right, but it's better to do it from, from the first line like this. And if white plays here, the point is that black gets to play this Atari and then can connect to the center. So it's just dead. So the white would continue here, black would kill it, and black throws in. So in order to throw in black, um, that's why black played this hanging connection on the third line to have a complete connection there. So it's dead. So that black can kill this group by playing the honey underneath. Um, and if white plays here, for instance, then it's very easy. Black just plays the Tories from this side and captures it. Right, right. And the point is that, like, if black had played, if black had played here, then white would have had three liberties. So white has time to cut here. Whereas if black plays that honey underneath, white only has two liberties. So white doesn't have any time to counterattack. And it's just dead. And my theory is that um, Iyama must have had a blind spot here. Because when white gets into this variation where he allows black to wedge here, it's going to be OK for white if white can play this cut early. Um, like I was saying, if white can play the cut early and black has to allow white to either uh, live on the side or one of these two variations, these would both be wins for white. So if white can cut here early, and for instance, if black plays here, um, then white would start with stuff like this, and it would be a different story in the center. But the fact that white has to connect here first is very painful. This exchange here, it increases the, the value of those four white stones left on the right side, these four stones here. And it, it reduces the danger for black, because black has already captured these stones in the corner. So black has got his, um, his reward early, and white is still faced with uh, this liability. And so I, I figured that if white, white was thinking for a moment there that he could cut here early, and this would lead into a variation where white was good, except for the fact that maybe he overlooked this move. And it's a relatively simple move. So like, if I'm wrong, I'm sure that Yama will be annoyed with me. Uh, <laughs> but it, it seems likely that, it seems logical that it, when he got into this variation, uh, the idea that he could cut here early, if he thought so, that would sort of um, validate the, this variation for him. It would make it look good for him. And so I'm figuring that this is the move that he overlooked. Yeah. And people have their blind spots sometimes, even the top players. So he had to connect here. So it, it's so obvious that um, I figured that he figured it out at this point. It was just a very, uh, a relatively simple mistake. But he realized at this point that he could not cut here. He was probably kicking himself. Yeah, I'm sure. And so this is already a win for Black. But actually, the end game was sort of interesting. So I, I will. Show you, show you a bit of the end game. Um, you can see white did get something back here, but it's not enough to make up for what white lost on the right side. Mm. And the, the center, black center, is not being damaged very much. In fact, the center is intact, isn't it? It's completely intact now. Yeah, it's completely intact. And so black gained a lot here. Um, it's just the, the, the fact that white's got a little bit extra in the center here. But Black got all of this. This is close to 20 points that Black gained here. That's just, so that, was a 20, that was a 20-point swing, right? Yeah. Well, this, this just in the corner here, that was big. It was something close to 20 points. The center stayed status quo. So White got some points back in, um, in, on the lower side to the center area. This area is bigger than it was before. So White uh, got several points back. Um, and White did get Sente to, to move, to, to play these other endgame moves. So it wasn't like it was more than 10 points. It was less than 10 points. But um, it gave Black a, a small lead. Which, and part of that lead he's going to throw away, which is going to make it exciting. <laughs> like AlphaGo. Yeah, like so AlphaGo. So you're annoyed. 
yeah, I'm annoyed. Oh, I, um, it was actually pretty dangerous for him. Uh, they're playing good Yosei so far. Yes, I've been looking at that. That's huge. And now black covers on the right side. That's big, too. And white immediately plays this. Um, but this was an opportunity for black to play away. Black played here. Um, and this was slack. And I think he played it because he thought he was winning. Just like the story of this game, uh, it was such a big present black got to the, towards the end of the game. Oh. Surely he's just assuming that he's winning. Like um, With time control, sometimes you don't have time to, to count it very thoroughly. And sometimes it's not a good idea to try to count it too thoroughly when the re reading out the position is more important sometimes. But this was just really small. If Black had played this move, this is a huge move in the lower left corner. If Black had played here, okay, he would okay, have had huge. a relatively big, um, a few points. Uh, many, in the game, he ended up 25 points anyway. Excuse me? Just, just, uh, just uh, uh, that's, a, that's a classic thing. People should know. I mean, that, that's so big. Uh, just a rough it's idea. so big just because there's the um, fo Black the follow up uh, with. Let's see, like white white could play here. There's the follow-up with this move. It's just the fact that every every time black does something, like um actually it's, it probably wasn't good for black to allow white to play eight, but uh later on in the game, like when black plays stuff like this, there's just more and more. Like uh, every time black adds a adds a move there, um white's territory is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Every every move is very that black adds to it, it's very effective. So there's all these follow-up moves uh, that make it much more big than just that one thing. There's also the fact that when white plays there, like if white plays there, um, eventually black will be putting a stone in at this point to protect the cut when the when the liberties get filled. And so there's um, it's just all it's 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 one of the end game moves that like there's so many variations depending on who plays the next move at each branching point, that um, it's almost like an exercise that you could do to, to practice your counting if you like the end game. And so if you don't like the end game, it's probably one of the points where you get bored. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's really a, a very difficult to calculate exactly. But just because of all those follow-ups that happen, uh, and that's one of the reasons that it's such a big move. So playing playing uh, this move is big too, but locally black can just black would just answer here and answer here, and it, um, or maybe do that in the other direction. Um, black could play it from this side too, and it's not such a big deal. It's just a couple of points. Well, it's a, it's a few points, but it's not as big as the lower left corner. So white played here once, and this was actually smaller than the lower left corner. So if white had played here, it would have been extremely close. Black will take that. Okay, they both missed it. They both missed it. And I think Black's going to win. But it's going to be fairly close in this case. It would have been an exciting end game. But in the game, White connected here, and Black got to play this point. So after this, it's a comfortable win for Black. Uh -huh. Just to show you the moves. They, they did go on to the end of the game. Um, after this, it's a fairly straightforward end game. Yeah, nothing special. Oh, they did start a little pro there, and that expanded Black's week, Black's lead. I think they ended up making a trade, but that was just because White was losing anyway. So White only got ten points back in the upper left, while Black got to take all these. That was fifteen points, and in the process, Black played a couple of moves that lost a point, like this one. So it was it was less than a five point um, gain. But um, and Black was winning in any case, but this expanded Black's lead to six and a half points. Wow! So interesting because uh, so would you say that that uh, Mutsura's uh, you know style or strategy paid off because? You know, just watching it, it just seemed like you know up until the really the the beginning of the end game, 
very comfortable, really no fireworks, nothing dramatic. And is that is that maybe a strategy also for playing in a lightning game where there's short time time? Uh, time lightning for? games are very dangerous when you get into fights. Yeah. So it is a fairly common tactic, you might say, to to play relatively calmly and try to keep things, especially if you're confident in the end game. Mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. actually with Mutsura, I, I had not noticed that in most of his games. So maybe it was just his tactic in this particular game. I, I'll, I'll have to take a closer look at his games to see if he typically plays in this style. Okay. Um, but I'm thinking right now that maybe it was um, just a tactic for this particular game against Yama. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see he did it very well. He plays a very patient game. And he did have various ideas about things that he was going to try to do like uh, for instance that uh, that attachment that he did in upper upper left he was looking at these ideas let's see if i can find that move um this move here in the upper left he, he did have these ideas that could be very dangerous if white had uh, fought back strongly and so of course white was wise to play this but in this case it does gain a few points um and it makes it difficult for White to calculate exactly how far, how much of a lead he had. Uh -huh. And so it is a, um, actually that style is a style that um, throughout my career, I've usually had a lot of trouble playing against. So it's the type of player that I, I tend to underestimate. Uh -huh. and, um, I feel really happy about the game and then just one, one relatively small miss and it's all over. And no, that was the, the speed at which things fell apart. And I know we've been looking at all these AlphaGo games where, you know, you give AlphaGo, you know, that lead that the Yama had and, and you know, mm -hmm. you know, 100 That's times right. out of 100 times. Sometimes it might, would find a way to make it a half a point, though. I was going to say, you might, yeah, they might get make it close, but there's just no way that it's going to fall right. apart like that. Exactly. So, Wow. Uh, big Ben, uh, that's that's a big win from Mutsuda against the Yama. Yama's a tough customer. He's a tough customer. I, I think the idea with the Yama, Yama team was the, um, since Shibano's team had not, well, he didn't knock out all of them because he started in the second round, but he knocked out a number of players. And so Yama's team and um, Ichiriki's team, both of them had lost two players. And so they were starting to get worried about Mutsura. And so they put in Iyama. Like Iyama was the, the captain, the top players. I yes, think the idea was he was going to slow this guy. Player. Like he was going to take it to the end of the tournament, hopefully. Yeah. So knocking him out was big, and it also gave Mutsura the most, the largest number of wins in a row. That's right. And so in this tournament, that's really important because you're knocking out players of the other teams, and the the winner gets to continue playing. So it's very efficient for the winning team. And he was the MVP. So in this tournament, they called MVP the Golden Panda. Golden Panda. I, I think he's uh, he gets to keep that uh, title. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great title. So he took that Panda. home with him. Nice. Well, great game, great commentary, as always, Michael. Really exciting. And, and a nice uh, change of pace uh, from all these uh, AlphaGo or AlphaGo, you know, master human games. Uh, hey, before we go, we have a very special treat uh, coming up next week. We'll be off the week after, folks, so you'll definitely want to be here next week. We're going to be front page for one thing, um, but do you want to give people just a little bit of a, of a teaser about next week's game? Because we're, we're, we're doing a, a, class, a, a classic. A classic game, yes. But but not not a 400-year-old game this time. Uh, it's it's going to be one of the Jubango games, so it's... Um, one of the 10 game matches that Gosegan was playing. Uh -huh. um, and the most famous one is called the Kamakura Jubango, which was just because they played the games in Kamakura. That's an, er that's an area in Japan. And his best friend and one of his main rivals, Kitani Minoru, was playing against him. And this, this first game of the match, I think it's the first game of the match, it's one of my famous favorite games uh, because Actually, Gosegan talked to me about it. And he talked about how, when, when I was studying with Mr. Gosegan, he, he, he reminisced about this game. And it was funny because Gosegan and Kitani had this different take. Um, 
on the opening. And Kitani was so fond of territory, while Gosegen was happy when he had stones on the outside. Uh-huh. And they were when they studied the game in the um, after the game, when they were studying the game, they were both so happy about the same position from opposite <laughs> sides. So, and he was talking funny. about that. It was very humorous. And that's some one of the one one of the um, times with him that um, just remains in my memory. It was very special. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Well, that's a great uh, a great uh, tease for for next week's game. I'm 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 really looking forward to. It. I love uh, like you. I really love these classic games. I'm very happy to be uh, sort of entering a, a different era to take a look at some of those games. Uh, and of course, folks know Michael is very big on the, on Go history, so it's going to be fun to to talk about some of that. And I I didn't realize you had a personal connection to it, so even better. So very nice. Oh, the game. All is right, awesome. folks. Sorry? The game is going to be fascinating. Oh, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> it's always good. All right, folks. Uh, thanks, as always, for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thanks, as always, to Michael. Great analysis. Uh, I think I got most of it. Um, and uh, just a reminder, keep an eye on uh, Michael's uh, YouTube. We have more of that new series coming, and you're not going to want to miss any of those. Uh, and of course, we're continuing with our um, uh, AlphaGo versus AlphaGo. We got a lot of stuff going on here, but uh, you're you're going to be keep you keep you busy. So uh, keep keep watching, keep checking those things out. Uh, thanks, of course, uh, to the American Go Association. Check them out, usgo.org, uh, and all of you who are members. If you're not, uh, check it out. A lot of good stuff from the uh, Go Association. We've been putting out some articles recently about playing Go during the pandemic. Uh, so you'll want to see that. Um, uh, and uh, finally, thanks, of course, to our producer, the fabulous Stephen Hu. Uh, stay healthy, Stephen. You're doing a great job. Really appreciate it. We would not be here uh, without Stephen. Uh, and that's going to do it for tonight. We will see you all next week, same place, same time, with another historic game. Take care. See you next week.